So I think the topic today will stir some interest, especially with all these talks about taking risks in a very volatile world now. now I don't know whether you understand risk. It's almost present in anywhere. You make a choice, you are faced with a risk, right? As students, and if you take a very demanding course in school, you face the risk of not doing well. Or working adults, uh, if you um, demand, choose a high paying job, you face the risk of not performing up to expectation. And those, uh, if you have a physical condition, you're going for an operation, there's a risk involved. Risk is everywhere. And now, especially with all the infected cases increasing exponentially, and coming to church and engaging in gathering like this involves risk. So risk is everywhere. It exists in almost all human activities. And risk increases, especially with volatile and uncertain situation. And most people's reaction to that is to minimize risk. In fact, if given a choice, I think no one would want to take risk. But the question is, why are people still taking risks? The simple answer is because they believe there are gains in taking risks. And they believe and they hope that a gain will be reaped through risk taking. And so most people's mentality is, if I am not doing well currently, why not risk something? Maybe I will end up some, uh, something better. Uh, I have seen single people before who were so, so lonely. And then they dated someone overseas whom they knew from the internet. And then come a day, they just forgo everything they have right here, fly over to another foreign country and want to start a family with someone they barely know in person. Now, to me, that's a great risk. Anyone do that? No, I, I think most people won't do that. But when you have got too lonely, too broken, and find no meaning in this life you have now, you will risk it. But most people will not go to that kind of extreme risk. We usually take moderate risk. And what we call, as our government always say, calculated risk, right? We take calculated risk to open our borders and so that an you know, economy can get going. It will do good for our economy or employment in one way or another. So with all these calculated risks, it makes risk sound more acceptable or worth considering. But with risk, no one knows. No one can be sure that the final outcome will be a gain or loss. So a lot of time with risk involved and decision needed to be taken, much of it seems to fall back on the person personality of individuals. Say for instance, some people, they are risk taker. To them, they always say, let's give it a go. No risk, no gain. Some people, they are risk adverse. They always take a more conservative approach, you know. To them, when they're faced with risky situation, they will always ask themselves, what if? And they tend to think about the outcome in a negative light. Now, what if I don't read the well outcome? What if things turn out worse? And I was preaching this message, you know, many phases went through, you know, my mind. And so some of you are risk adverse. I think most of you are risk adverse. Anyone? Very risk taking? Some, a few. Or anyone who, who just loves to take risks for the adrenaline, you know, you feel the adrenaline or the kick, you know, of taking risks. No, I know it, it's a personality thing. That's what many people say. But with the running of the church, I don't think we should leave decisions to personalities. In risky situations, we must seek the directives from the Word of God. Especially so in situation or uh, decision that involves risk. And in opening the church at this time, in gathering believers for meeting, there are definitely risks involved. But what actually impel us to take those risks? Right? 
And as individual Christians, we are called to be responsible to God, responsible to people around us, at least responsible to our family members. So while we know we shouldn't take unnecessary risks, but you ask, is it God's will for us to always string back all the time when risk is involved? And I can tell you one thing that I've always struggled in my Christian life, and for quite some time, is about risk-taking. I always struggle with the fact, should Christian take risks? It's a very hard to answer question. And if yes, how much risk? And is there a point when our risk-taking becomes foolish and unnecessary? Now, if I just mentioned, with risk-taking, what is undesirable is that no one can be sure whether it will result in a gain or loss. But what if I tell you now, if there is a kind of risk-taking that will always result in a gain, and the Bible does intently tell us that those risks has to be taken. And those risks will eventually, definitely yield returns. And I call this faithful risk taking. Faithful risk taking. Now I'm going to run through a few instances in the book of the Gospels where individuals step out in faith and took risks and they received overwhelming response from our Lord Jesus. Let's look, go to Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. Now, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him, said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, we know the Old Testament, and those with leprosy are regarded as unclean people. And these unclean people, they are instructed by God to stay away from the community. And now, imagine an unclean person and who's supposed to stay away, and now he comes running into the big crowd in search of Jesus. Now, the, the rough, can you imagine? He reads the rough and the descent of the large crowd when he seeks Jesus for healing. And one of the reasons I think most of us would hate is the inviting of critics or reproaches of men, isn't it? But you see, look at what he gets out of this. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. Jesus said, I am willing. He said, be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Right? And another very classic one, Luke chapter 5. Most of us will have read this. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the Lord were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, basically the whole of Israel. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. It was at this time. Okay? And then some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the towels into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. Now, two things you would like to take note about these people. First, they took a risk in bringing a paralytic to a place with big crowd for healing, where the possibility of meeting Jesus was very low. And indeed, they didn't manage to get through because of the crowd. But then, that spurred them to take a bigger risk in interrupting Jesus' sermon. In fact, they are interrupting the whole session in a very, very provoking way by going up on the roof, making a hole and lowering somebody right in the midst where Jesus was preaching. Now, I cannot imagine well, do, preaching someone do that, you know. Right? You cannot imagine that. Now, I, I can tell you, when we don't need the Lord enough, we will not go to that extent. And sometimes we usually attribute our inability to follow the Lord due to some circumstances. And sometimes we say, I want to come to church, but it's raining, you know. Or things crop up. 
I, I want to come to church, but my kids were sleeping, they don't have enough sleep, they're cranky and all, okay? But these men went all the way. Next, what caught me was, these men, they are not doing this for themselves. They are doing this for their paralyzed friend. Now, usually we only take big risks for ourselves. And we don't take big risks for others. But these men took the risk for their friends. And I'm always very thankful for brethren who took risks to minister to people, to present to them the gospel. Sometimes, you know, we have to present the gospel to some helpless people or say a teacher. You have to present the gospel to a helpless student. Though by law, you're not allowed to, but risk is involved. But you know it's imperative to take those risks. You know what I mean? And so what comes after this? When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. And if you read on, you know the paralyzed men were healed and he went home praising God. Another one, Matthew chapter 15, about the Canaanite women. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came, vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. I'm amazed by the knowledge of Jesus by the Canaanite women. And when he called the Lord Jesus, the son of David, that's a messianic title. We know that, right? The son of David, whom David also called Lord. Now He is the one who is to come to restore the kingdom of David in full. And these Gentiles, these Canaanite women, just call out and said, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, she is pleading for mercy. She is not demanding mercy. And she said, my daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. Now, despite of all the healing that Jesus has done, the disciples were not very keen about this case. Why? Because first, Jesus kept silent despite her cries. And second, for the fact that this woman is a Canaanite, she's a Gentile, and she knows she, she almost stand no chance. Nevertheless, she took the risk and come pleading before Jesus. And Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And women came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. And Jesus replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now, seemingly to mean it is not right to give the blessing of Israel to you unclean and undesirable Gentiles. Now it seems that the women' persistence was met with rejection, followed by an insult. But why did our Lord Jesus say those words to her? Because our Lord is showing his disciples what is true faith. You understand that? True faith is always coupled with full humility. And now, my brethren, when we sinners come to the Lord Jesus, what do we do? And we say, God, show us grace. It's as if we expect and demand our Lord to show us grace. Now, if you demand God to show you grace and mercy, something must tell you that is not grace anymore. That is not mercy anymore. God doesn't own you grace. And some people come to God and say, you are supposed to deliver me. Come, Lord, you know. Now, when you come with that kind of attitude, it shows that you know nothing about grace. It shows that you know nothing about faith. And obviously, you know nothing about what is faithful risk-taking. And sometimes we do have that kind of mindset. And we say, God, we take risks. You know, we spend time. We sacrifice this and that to come and worship you and serve you. So God, 
bless us with this, that, provide us with this and that. No. That's the wrong mindset, wrong mentality to start with. That's not faith. That's not faithful risk-taking. Faithful risk-taking stems from a heart which is full of humility. For he knows he is a sinner and he knows who he is pleading with. And so the Canaanite women reply, Yes, it is Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Jesus was amazed. And how did Jesus reply? And Jesus said, Women, you have great faith. You saw that? You have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Now, we've just read a few different healing encounters by Jesus and the sick. But every encounter actually speaks about a few similarities. I'm going to show you this similarity. Number one, listen. The first similarity is, shows us every healing, every answer from God actually involves some risk. You notice? Either the risk of being despised by the onlookers, or the risk of not receiving healing, the risk of being rejected or insulted. And meaning to say, when a person comes to Jesus, he can never come to him comfortably. He can never come to Jesus or follow Jesus with a risk-free or cost-free mentality. You see, here is the paradox. We know salvation is free by the grace of God. And equally, healing and deliverance come by the grace of God. But somehow, when the sinner was to come to the Lord, he will find himself having to bear the yoke and the burden of that risk. He has to bear that risk by faith. And the risk is always there to test the genuineness of the person's faith. But in these encounters, we are also explicitly told that Jesus responded to the individual's faith as it was manifested in the risk-taking by granting what he or she desired. In fact, the response of our Lord Jesus was not only moderate, it was, in fact, overwhelming, I should say. The healing, the answers received were exceeding and abandoned. The faithful risk-taking doesn't just reap a consolation price. It's a big price, you get what I mean? So what does that tell us? Basically, it tells us that no one can be half-hearted when they approach God in His grace. Faithful risk-taking know that trust in God don't hold back. It doesn't entertain the hypothetical questions like, what if God doesn't heal? What if God doesn't provide for me? What if things don't turn out fine? What if I suffer loss while doing the will of God? You see, faithful risk-taking don't ask those hypothetical questions. Faithful risk-taking always asks, what is the will of God now? What does God want me to do now? What is His instruction for me in this situation? And He went on to take that risk by faith. Saw that? Now let me make you understand why the church should continue service even if in fact the cases goes up, you know. I mean all the time I hear people come up here and sit and pray for all these infected cases or you know, and how we should uh, guard our hearts and all. But let me make you understand why the church should continue service. And some people say, Pastor, you are very bold. No, no. Actually, it's not a question of being bold. No. It's about faithful risk-taking. Because if we ask a critical question, are we keeping the church open because the community cases are low? Now, we, we are keeping it open. For what? Because, not because the community cases are low, but because we believe in the communion of saints, right? So we believe in the spiritual gains gotten from meetings. And that supersedes the risk involved. So even with 500 cases or 1,000 cases, the belief and principle doesn't change. 
So are we going to say 50 cases? We go on. Well, 500 cases, we close shop, string back. And that's not faithfulness. Okay, we started off with a faithful risk-taking step because we saw church as essentials, right? So with more cases now, church is still, and in fact, more essential. Okay, now it's the same principle where we apply this to other aspects of our Christian life. And some Christian parents I saw, they, they allow their child to stop coming to church during exam period. And so that they can have more time to study. See, my child very stressful already, you know, still have to spend that few hours, go to church, you know. So, which means to me, they don't get what is church for, right? If you stop coming to church during your stressful period, what, what do you mean? Which means that you are attending church with the mentality of receiving blessing in church. Now, you don't come to church to receive blessing, you know, you are already blessed in Christ. You are already blessed in Christ. So you come here to draw near to the God who blessed you. Remember, right? To draw near, draw strength from Him. So in this stressful period, isn't it more imperative for you to draw near to God, to come to Him, to find strength? And if you are stressful at work, isn't it the time to draw closer to Him? So you see, the risk factor it's always there, and it has to be there. It's in fact there to help you struggle through, without which you don't know what is genuine faith. Right? The risk of, as I've said, not having enough time to study, not in having enough time for work, for my family, the risk of feeling too tired after service, the risk is always there to test the genuineness of your faith. The risk is there for you to struggle through so that you know to receive the best, you cannot be half-hearted. And that's the, exactly the reason why all who come to the Lord to receive healing has to go through that risk. And that's why I, I spoke about this a lot. I think um, in the, on the Thursday meeting, you know, if you hear my message, you know, now I said during this time of pandemic, I'm not looking for a big turnout in the church. I'm looking for consistency. For these two years of pandemic, I'm looking for consistency. I'm looking for believers who have been taught and learned the word, will no longer be blown and tossed around like the wind. They will not be double-minded. They will be stable in what they do, in what they choose. And I don't, I don't see high turnout in the church when cases are low, but people shrink from coming to church when infected cases go up. That shows that we haven't learned what is faithful risk-taking. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and you ask, Pastor, why are you always so concerned about this? Because it got to do with your fundamental beliefs in the Lord. It got to do with how we process the voice of God in a chaotic and confusing world. If we don't learn this right, we will always, forever, encounter the same obstacle. We will always fall short in prioritizing the things of God when risk of loss is involved. You know, last week, you know, uh, last Saturday, <clears throat> and, and Deacon John, when De Deacon John came for service, you know, he looks a bit distraught. Last Saturday, if you all noticed, you know, I asked him what happened. Yeah. What happened was some I heard from him, you know, some big hiccups you know, happened at work to the point where even his CEO come chasing after him, ask him what's wrong, this and that, you no. Know. So he, he ended up working from morning till evening on Saturday. And then come evening, he made his way to service and he presided as usual. And then on Sunday, wake up morning start working, clear the mess until late morning, and then he brings the family to church again Sunday. And then after church, I saw him, he was at the room, he carried on with his work until the evening, so he does what he needs to do. No change of plan, no change of duty. He does his best, trust God with the outcome while fulfilling his Christian obligations. And this is what I'm talking about. When I say I'm not looking for great faith, I'm looking for consistent faith. And now it sounds easy in usual terms, but when things happen, 
and to practice consistency, risk is involved. And in this case, he might risk, you know, um, giving boss bad impression. He might risk his promotion. You know, he might risk a lot of things, his career. But this is the time that calls for faithful risk taking. And I realize a lot of Christians, when faced with this kind of dilemma, they tend to go for the easy way. They forgo church, they get someone to take over their servings, they focus fully on their work. That's because they haven't been taught what is faithful risk taking. Now, I'm just giving you an example, okay? I'm just giving you one example. It just have so happened last week for Brandon. But challenging situations come all the time. But I know with every challenge, God demands faithful risk taking. And sometimes making a stand for our faith involves risk. Being inject, rejected by others, or sometimes there are situations where God wants us to risk our time and energy to help someone in need. And we may not be appreciated by people we help all the time, but a reward comes from God. And we have to get used to this as Christians. When God allows trials, difficulties, challenges in our life, you ask, what is it for? And when I talk about risk, you know, the world is taking all kinds of risks foolishly. But now, we are worshiping, worshiping an almighty God who guarantee us the gains, given us his promise, and shouldn't we take risks? Last week, I baptized quite a few people. I know two sisters among us who were baptized. Their spouse were not in pro approval of their baptism, and they took risks. One, one of them is my sister-in-law, and her husband has plainly told me and my wife many times that he doesn't approve uh, of his wife baptism, and we better not do it, but I did it anyway. <laughs> I don't know, I have to do it. I mean, and I, I mean, if you me, you were thinking, you know, how I'm going to see the, him again, you know, the next Chinese New Year, you know, how he's going to be like, what kind of face he's going to show me, and all. But that's not the problem, okay? Now, these are risks that we have to take. So, we take those risks, and we believe there will be overwhelming and abundant response from God. And we have to learn this. If not, we'll never grow. We'll always be fearful and string back with the same challenges. Now, I'm going to read you another parable in the Bible about faithful risk-taking. Matthew 25. And just now, and CJ will have read this, okay, but let's um, read it again. I'm going to bring, through, bring you through this parable. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to now one talent each according to his ability. And then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and set accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master said, you entrusted me five talents, you have gained five more. 100% gain. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Just faithful in a few things. You'll be rewarded with taking charge many many things but come and share your master's happiness and same with the two talents one okay verse 23 and master praise him likewise but verse 24 then the man who had received one talent came master he said i knew that you are a hard man harvesting where you have not sown or gathering and gathering where you have not scattered seed so i was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground See, here is what belongs to you. The master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on 
deposit with the bankers. This is the least you should do. So that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. Now take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Now this is what we, we, we love to have, abundance. Abundance of everything. Abundance of uh, wealth, health, and, uh, opportunities, and resources. And how does it come? Have you asked? Reason involved. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I don't want to over expound the passage, you know, but it tells us a few things about faithful risk taking. Number one, both the five talent and two talent seven servants, they went at once. Now, you notice the word at once to put the money entrusted to them to work. In other words, they put those talents at risk for potential loss. But what was laudable is that there was no delay in their submission. Now, procrastination is the number one hindering factor to faithful risk-taking. Now, Charles Spurgeon says, by a little procrastination that men ruin their souls. Now, in fact, if you ponder through most of the time, people don't intend to delay for months and years. Just a few days, okay, I'll get back to serious work. No, that's what many people say, you know, when they delay. But as they say that, slowly, as the day goes by, they find themselves having more fear, more reluctance to get on with what they have been instructed to do so by God. And then as they wait and waited, more doubts, more difficulties began to arise in their hearts. And they began to give themselves excuse for not doing so. You realize that? Now, I suppose for the one talent servant, this is his mind, you known. Probably as he procrastinates, he starts thinking he's going to read much. He's not going to read much anyway. You know, my master won't take this seriously. You know, or my master would have probably received a lot more from other servants. You know, it doesn't matter for my. So he makes things. He makes excuses for not submitting to God. And uh, and also, of course, maybe he would be thinking, I only have one talent. He fear. Uh, then he might suffer loss. So he shunned the risk. He buried his talent in the ground where it would be safe from all loss. Now, when Brandon, you always question yourself. When you have heard the word of God, why did you procrastinate in submission? Was it you are too busy? Was it you are afraid? Or you want to take a wait and see approach? Let others do it first? You know. Now, actually, it all stems from disbelief. It's a disbelief problem. You didn't believe what God said. You didn't believe what God has promised. And that is why you're not willing to risk anything. You're not willing to risk your time, your energy, your resources, your comfort to obey what God has plainly instructed. It's number one. Now, procrastination speaks a lot. Okay. Number two, and in each case, we are told that the master blessed the first two servants faithful risk-taking with 100% returns. And let me make this clear to you. Every time we risk, it's inevitable. We worry about the possibility of loss. Right? I mean, this is true for every risk-taking endeavor we take in this world. Uh, but over here, the Lord is assuring us that if we took a risk in obedience to God, it will always, always be a gain for us. And it will be an overwhelming gain, no doubt about it. So let us not feed our doubts and fear when we are faced with risky situation. I think throughout this pandemic, you know, sometimes uh, me and my co-workers, we sit down and discuss uh, how should we plan things for the church. You know? and sometimes my co-workers ask me, Pastor, when we open the church you know, and let people in readily, are you very sure that we won't have infected people coming in our midst? 
Have you thought about that? <laughs> now, I'm sure everyone thought about that. And what next? If there is one infected person here, and then he come for the service, he leave the service, and it's found out, then the implication the MOH will give us a call, and then everyone who attends the service will be quarantined, will be inconvenienced, and then if things don't turn out well, we end up having a cluster, and then we'll be on the papers again, <laughs> and people start thinking, what's wrong with this church again? <laughs> Now, have you, have you ever thought about that? You know, if only just one person. So far, we have close shape, you know. <laughs> but we, don't, we don't have such things happen yet. But so my co I'm very sure, Pastor, you know, that these things won't happen. And I say, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure whether we'll be absolutely free of infected people coming to miss. But I mean, you look at the rising cases now and all. I cannot guarantee that. But what I, I know and what I could guarantee by the word of God is if we open a church now in obedience to God and for the love and the benefit of our brethren, the church will always gain and will gain overwhelmingly. Now, that's my assurance, okay? Now, I cannot promise you anything out of the blue, no, which I'm not sure but. I can promise you what I believe, what the Bible says. No. That's the thing. That's the promise of obedience. And for that, I'm willing to take the risk. And I'm sh I make sure all my co-workers read me in this. I tell you, in uncertainties and volatile situations, all the more we must learn not to question the outcome, but to question whether we are acting in obedience to God now. Okay, you get what I mean? All right. So the very reason the five talent and two talent servants took the risk is not because they were sure on returns, no, no, or they're bolder, or their risk-taking personalities, no, not that, but because they knew the master. They really know the master differently from the one talent servant that wicked and lazy servant. And tellingly, this servant buried his talent because he don't really know his master. And knowing our Lord makes all the difference in our submission and risk-taking faith. If you know our master to be faithful and just, and he meant what he said, that he rewards those who obey him, then you will willingly take the risk to obey. Now, if you know him superficially, if you're only coming to church for blessings, a few good experiences, it wouldn't provoke you to take any risk in obedience to him. You will want to keep your talent, keep your time, keep your gifts, keep your resources, keep your talents. You wouldn't risk anything. You wouldn't risk anything investing for his kingdom. And that's the whole point of this message, okay? And before we end, Okay, let's ask, can risk-taking become something foolish? How far can we go before risk-taking become something foolish? Now, this is something we have to be informed also, okay? Yes, it can be something foolish, times. And I would say the key lies in faith. Now, the, the risk, any risk that we take that has nothing to do with faith in God, nor obedience to Him, it's foolishness. So someone can foolishly believe that, you know, I take some risk to buy shares or cryptocurrency could be God's way of enriching me, you know. That's not faithful risk-taking. That's greedy risk-taking, okay? Or someone just drive recklessly and you know, claims that God will protect him. No, I think that's testing God, okay? So in fact, in the start of the pandemic, you know, I've told the church we... We're not irresponsible, irresponsible people. We're not foolish Christians you know, who, who doesn't know science or who don't believe in all these things about the virus. And oh, we know these things, okay? But we know God who's greater than these things. So in the midst of pandemic, I say, no, we come to church in faith, by faith, in obedience to God. And then after that, go home, 
straight home, avoid crowded places, you know. And that's not being afraid, but just being watchful. And we should not test God in such matters. So you see, when we deviate from the faith principle of God, and we start to live recklessly, randomly taking risks, now that is foolishness. And all of us should be mindful not to give ourselves to foolishness. And it is important to know that God responds to faith. God doesn't respond to foolishness. But, let me end with this. If our risk-taking is faith-driven to start with, it cannot be foolish, no matter how incredible the risk. As God promised, it will always end up with overwhelming and abundant gains. All right, I, so I pray that all of us learn something from this message and at least you remember what is faithful risk-taking. And by living that way, taking that kind of risk, you will always reap in this life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the words they've given us. It's a message you have for us um, when we are having unprecedented uh, infected cases in this country. But as your word tells us that we should fear not, we should just live as per normal, be consistent in our faith. As we do your will, uh, we have nothing to be afraid of. So Lord, bless all of us, all these people who make their way to the church. And Lord, and more than that, I pray for these people that in their lives, you know, they will always know how to discern your voice and to take the step of faithful risk-taking in their lives. Not only to this, in this pandemic per se, but in every aspect of our Christian living. And sometimes our faith is, is inconsistent. You know, we believe in one thing but not the other. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit show us clarity, reveal to us the state of our heart, the frame of our mind as we approach you. Let us know that as we come to you, that you want us to, to, be, to have stability in our perspectives and not to be tossed and moved around by the changing phenomenon of this world. And let us not be afraid to step out in faith to follow you. For you promise an overwhelming response. So Lord, thank you. And we look to you in the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.